um, the first uh, oral is Fuchsia Learning by Dimensionality Reduction in Gradient Space, um, and um, Martin Gauch will take over. All right, let's hope this works. Um, cool. Yeah, so I'll be presenting SubGD, which is the Fuchsia Learning method that we present in our paper, Fuchsia Learning by Dimensionality Reduction in Gradient Space. Um, so as the title suggests, the, the topic that we tackle is Fuchsia Learning. And in Fuchsia Learning, one of the key challenges is that we have a model that might be very large, maybe have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of parameters. Um, and we'd like to adapt that model to a new task, but we're only given very few labeled samples of that task. So we have this kind of imbalance that can very easily lead to problems like overfitting. So if you look at this, in a very simple um, toy setting with a model that has just two parameters. Um, we have some model initialization uh, that might also be pre-trained. That's this blue uh, dot in the lower left corner. And we'd like to adapt this model to a new task um, where the optimal solution to that task I've, I've highlighted here as this orange star. So what do we do? We're machiners, so we look at our samples and we calculate a gradient and do the first gradient step. And because we don't have much data, most likely that gradient step is not going to be very good. Like there's going to be lots of noise in the few samples that we have. And so it's not directly going to point us towards the optimum most likely. Um, but we keep doing these update steps. Um, but as we don't get any new information, all of these updates are going to be not very good. And most likely we're not going to end up really close to the optimum. So what we propose as a, as a possible solution to this problem is what we've called subspace learning. So the idea here is that if we knew that the solutions to the kinds of tasks that we focus on in a particular future learning um, setting, that these solutions always fall into the subspace that I've, identified, that I've highlighted here as this orange dashed line, then we can do much more targeted updates and eventually end up closer to the optimum. So instead of doing that first um, gradient step, instead we sort of do the next best thing that we can do within the subspace. And so that would be this first update here. Um, and we keep doing these updates until we hopefully, if this is a good subspace, end up much closer uh, to the optimum. Now, it's kind of intuitive that it, this might help um, boost sample efficiency, but only if we have a good subspace. So the question now is, um, where do we get that good subspace from? And to illustrate that, let me introduce you to sort of the training setup that we follow um, in our paper. So the way we do this is we have a number of different training tasks that are highlighted as these large blue circles. And they're large circles because for those tasks, we assume that we have lots of data available. So we can train an individual model on each of those tasks. Um, so what we do first is we pre-train a model on all of those tasks combined. But we're not, not really interested in the performance on those training tasks. What we actually care about is the performance on the test task. And this is the small circle, which is a small circle because this is actually the few short learning episode um, where we have very few labeled samples available. But before we move to the test task, we try to extract as much information as we can from the training tasks. So now to, to get this subspace, what we do is um, we consider each training task individually and we fine tune that pre-trained model on each of those tasks individually. So we take the first task, we fine tune the model um, and we get some fine tuned model or adapted model that I've called model one here. Um, and then we move to the next task. Again, we start with the pre-trained initialization we fine tune it to that task and so on. And this means we'll end up with lots of fine tuned models that all started from the same initialization. Um, and all of these fine tunings are going to work quite well uh, simply because we have lots of data on each individual task. So normal gradient descent is sort of going to do a good enough job, most likely at least. So now we have all these models and this is now where we extract the subspace. So what we do there is we calculate the autocorrelation um, of the differences between the fine tuned and the pre-trained models. Um, that might sound a bit complicated, but for all practical purposes, what you can think of is that we do a PCA on these differences between the fine-tuned models and the um, initialized model. There's a small detail here that it's actually um, an uncentered PCA, so we don't center this matrix uh, when we do the PCA, but that's sort of a minor detail. What really matters here is that out of this PCA, we get two things. First, we get out the principal components, which tell us which directions were most important during fine tuning on each one of these individual tasks. Um, and second, we get out the, the eigenvalues that correspond to each principal component. 
And these give us sort of a, a metric of how important each direction was. So the first principal component with the highest eigenvalue is going to be the one that was most important when we fine tuned our model on the training tasks. And the, the uh, principal component with the smallest eigenvalue is going to be the one that was uh, least important when fine tuning on these tasks. So given that information, we can actually now move to the test task and fine tune our model with the additional knowledge that we've uh, sort of gained from, from this uh, subspace extraction, this PCA uh, method. So the way that this uh, will work is by a modification of the normal SGD update rule. So where we would normally just take the, the grade, the negative gradient multiplied by some learning rate um, with sub, -G, sub GD, uh, we do some modifications to that gradient before we actually apply it as an update to our weights. The way we do this is by first by the, this matrix vector product um, with this matrix V and this matrix in its rows contains the principal components that, that came out of the PCA that I showed before. So what this does is um, out of this, this product, we get a low dimensional representation of the gradient um, that is in the, in the space that is spanned by the principal components that came out of the PCA. Now we take that, um, that low dimensional representation and we rescale it along each direction by the eigenvalues that also came out of the PCA. So this is really what um, encourages movements along directions that were important during on the training task, when we fine tuned on training tasks, and it did, discourages movement along the directions that were not considered important uh, when we fine tuned on the training tasks. And then finally, of course, we have to sort of retransform this low dimensional representation back into the full parameter space so that we can apply it as an update to our model weights. So this is sort of the, the, the sub GD update rule as we use it um, for inference on the test task. And so now let me um, briefly introduce you to some of the exper experimental results that we had. Um, I won't cover all of what we did in our paper, but for the sake of time, I'll just focus on one of the experiments, which is the RLC electrical circuit. So the task here is to predict the behavior of an electrical circuit over time and different few short learning tasks are simply given by electrical circuits of different physical properties. Um, so we measure the, the quality of our predictions in terms of mean squared error, which is what you see on the y axis here. Um, and on the x axis, you can see the support size. So this is the number of available of available label training samples uh, that we had for fine tuning the model. So the yellow line, which is simple SGD fine tuning, um, as it makes sense, the, the MSE decreases as we, add, as we add more training samples. Um, but what, what we can also see in this plot here um, is that the blue line, which is sub-GD fine tuning, achieves a lower MSE at uh, fewer training samples. So we're more sample efficient. And this is something that we could see more generally across different uh, sort of dynamical systems problems that sub-GD really helps to, to sort of increase um, the, the sample efficiency during fine tuning. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll leave it with this at, at the experimental results and give a brief outlook of possible future directions um, to, to keep working on, on this kind of uh, branch of research. The first one here is to broaden the applicability of sub-GD. We've already in the last talk heard something about negative results. Uh, so one thing that doesn't work so well with sub-GD so far is um, image classification in few short learning tasks. So the classical mini image net style um, image classification tasks, um, there we've seen that it's much harder to identify good subspaces or to identify low dimensional subspaces that are shared by different tasks. Um, and we've seen that, or we, we think that it might actually help here to use methods that are able to identify more complex structures um, that are maybe not nonlinear, where the PCA method that we, that we use so far uh, can only identify linear uh, subspaces. Uh, things like autoencoders might be a good start here. A second future research direction would be to sort of incentivize the adherence to these subspaces already when we do the fine tuning on the training tasks. So currently we fine tune on each training task individually and we just sort of hope that each fine tuning trajectory uh, stays within a subspace that is shared um, across, across all the individual um, tasks. But what we could do instead is um, have some, some incentive for each of these fine-tuning trajectories to stay sort of synchronized and um, maintain a low-dimensional subspace that is already shared by the, by the training tasks. 
All right, um, and with that, I'll close, and I'm happy to answer any, any questions that, are, that have come up. Yeah, there's a question in the chat. Um, can you let us know what the motivation and inspiration behind choosing subgradient space is? So the idea here is um, basically goes back to the beginning here, uh, to this slide, um, is that if I have a large model and I have very few samples and I try to fine tune that model in this large space, there's, there's so many directions that I can go into um, and I have so much noise in my training samples that I'm unlikely to take the right directions. Whereas if I try to uh, learn a much more low dimensional subspace from all the training tasks that I have, um, I can sort of ignore all that noise and focus on the, on the relevant signal um, that, that leads me more closely towards the optimum. Oh, yeah. Thank you for the talk. Um, so I have maybe two questions, one question is, what's the assumption you make uh, about the relationship between training and and do you think it's a meaningful baseline to have where you just uh, fine tune on all the training tasks and test tasks together and then convert that to your method? Or maybe it's not a meaningful baseline. Yeah, okay. Um, so the, sorry, the first part, part of the question was. Yeah, what's the relationship between Oh, yeah. And yeah. The, the relationship between training and test tasks. Uh, so we don't assume a formal kind of relationship or at least not explicitly, but um, what, we, what we assume is that uh, there exists, well, obviously we assume that there exists a subspace that we can, uh, inside of which we can do fine tuning that can solve all of these tasks. So it means that if I fine tune, or if I do fine tuning on all of the training tasks, the subspace that I identify from those tasks um, has to also work for a new task. We actually do experiments on this. Maybe I can show this slide. Um, this one, maybe this one. Um, so what you see here is basically a measure of the subspace size on the y-axis, and on the x-axis you can see the number of tasks. So you can see that as you add more tasks, the subspace size increases, uh, or it, it barely increases after a while. So this means as a new task comes along, most likely I can solve this task um, with, the, with the subspace that I've identified already from all previous tasks. That's sort of the the practical side of this assumption, we don't formally uh, define it, right? And the second part of the question was the, whether it's a meaningful baseline to just train on all tasks together, right? Yeah, um, I think this very much depends on the task. So if you have a task that you can, where I guess from the inputs you can, you can figure out which, ta which task setting you're in, then this probably is a meaningful baseline. If I have a task where for the same inputs, it depends on the task what the solution is, then my model would have no chance to figure out what solution it should output. So I would say it depends on the task whether this is a good baseline or not. Um, so I'm not entirely sure I understood the question. Is the question um, whether it, how good the solution is when we project into a low dimensional space versus the full space? Uh, so it seems like a process, so some maps will discover subspace discovery methods, then force projections into the underlying space, and then do the step in the underlying space. But this seems to be a softer version of that, that is nudging the gradient. We actually do force it to be in the subspace. Um, well, it depends on, on the size of, your, of this matrix V that I had in the update rule. So if I have a PCA where, if I, if I do this PCA and I have more um, tasks than I have model weights, then this PCA would actually just do, do a, uh, like a, a rotation of the space. Yeah, this is a, I'm, I'm making an assumption now. 
in most cases, you don't have that. But if you had that, then you would not have a subspace anymore. You would just do that reprojection, uh, that rescaling by eigenvalues. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah.